Hello and welcome to the Grandfather's Cave. In a previous video, I have discussed the use of cards as game aids to make running adventures for role-playing games easier. In this video, I'm going to show you how. In order to prepare for and run an entire gaming session, I will be using an adventure first published in Dungeon Magazine issue 22 from 1990. It's an adventure called To Make Me Concern by Randy Maxwell. It is designed for a single player playing a paladin of level 4 to 6, but I will be adjusting it for an entire party of first level characters. I will also be modifying monsters and spells and items to match the rule set that I'm using. Originally, this adventure was designed for AD&D, but this adventure can easily be converted for any other version of the Dungeons & Dragons game, Pathfinder, or any other rule set that uses the D20 rule system. One of the reasons why I have chosen this adventure is because it's relatively short. It fits well for the next adventure that I'm going to run, which should last some three hours. Also, as you can see on this map, the adventure takes place in a rather small dungeon with only nine locations. In order to run this adventure, I will only need a map, these 20 homemade cards, and a single handout that I've made. While I generally don't make location cards for every single location in an adventure, I will be doing it in this video just to show you how I would go about doing it. The first cards I've made are special effect cards. The first of the special effect cards I've made is called Amnesia. That is because the premise of this adventure is that the adventurers find themselves in the dungeon and don't really remember what they're doing there or how they got there. This card shows me how to handle this by giving the players a 10% cumulative chance whenever they interact with the location within the dungeon of remembering a random fact that brought them to this point. This knowledge is also very useful, not only for creating the ambience of the adventure, but also to giving them a hint on how to successfully complete the adventure. As part of the amnesia effect in this adventure, the player characters might be reminded of a poem that has led them here. As a GM, I will of course read this poem to the player. I have also prepared a handout of this poem. I will tell the player that remembers this poem first, that they recall having it written down somewhere in their pack. When they search for it, then I will have a piece of paper that I can hand to the players, and they will be able to refer back to this poem whenever they want. This is important because a poem has a hint on how to complete this adventure. The other special effect card that I have included is the one called Icy Mist. I want this adventure to have a really eerie and haunted feeling to it. I also want to emphasize that this dungeon is affected by a supernatural winter curse. The effect of this curse is simple. It hinders visibility and causes the risk of slipping on icy surfaces. And thus this effect can be boiled down to three effects that I have to be attentive of. In the video I referred to earlier about creating custom cards for your game, I made a point of stating that when you make these cards, that the font size you use should be relatively large so that you can easily refer to the cards without having to strain yourself to reading them. However, location cards do represent a challenge here. If you want to include a lot of information on a card, the font has to be re relatively small. But in general, I would suggest try to minimize how much information you put on a card, don't put anything there that is not necessary, and keep the font size as large as you can. The first location in this, in this dungeon is called the entrance hall. The card describes how players can attempt to exit this room even prior to completing the adventure, and what happens if the adventurers attempt to climb out of the hole in the roof. The next location is called the alcoves, and it's basically a long corridor going north to south with a dozen alcoves in which they find the corpses of ancient elven warriors. If the party moves north or south along this corridor, they will trigger an attack from the ancient warriors in the alcoves. And thus I have made a card not only for the location, but also a card that describes the abilities and combat stats of the elven skeletons that guard this place. While there is a stat line on the top of the card listing strength, dexterity and so forth, the ones that I actually need are the ones that tell me how many hit points the monster has, its armor class, its saving throws, speed and its attack modifiers. It's also useful to have something like the special abilities including damage reduction listed on this card. But in reality, you don't need any more than this. With armor class, 
hit points, and attack modifiers, I think you have all the information you basically need. The next location is the collapsed area. In this area, the party will find two ancient corpses, one of a gnome and one of a dwarf. There's some loot here, but more interestingly, there are some roots growing out of the walls here that will attack the player characters when they disturb the corpses. This is not a part of their original adventure. This place was originally guarded by centaur skeletons. Also a very cool idea, but thematically I wanted to go for something different. Therefore I created these roots of corruption. They are very inspired by assassin vines, except that I have removed their grappler ability and given them a poison ability instead. Another thing that they find in this area is a magical hand axe. The hand axe is not very interesting, it's just a plus one hand axe. And while it is very powerful for a group of first level characters, it's not inherently interesting. However, something that is interesting about this hand axe is the runic text written on it. I therefore thought it was appropriate to make an item card for this hand axe so that it could share it easily with the players and so that they can always look at their card and see what these runes are actually saying. The next location, the meeting hall, is also pretty standard. However, there's an effect here. If the player characters, either through their investigation or combat, disturb the tapestry on the eastern wall, it might fall down on them. And if that happens, they might get entangled. Therefore, I thought it was a good idea to have a card both for the dwarven zombies that guard this place, shown here, but I will also be using a condition card that describes what the entangled condition does, because I know that is a very real threat in this encounter. In addition to the entangled condition, I think that the fatigue condition is one that might be very relevant for this game as well. And therefore, I will also have some fatigue cards ready to hand out to the players. The fifth location in this adventure is the storage. As you can see, this is a card with very little text. And the only thing that is important to remember here, aside from it being a storage room, is that there are some vials of acid that the players may find and be able to use later in the adventure. The next location is the laboratory. This again becomes a bit text heavy. But the important thing here to remember is that there is a complete alchemist lab that the players may be able to salvage. And there is a treatise, a book about how to become a lich. These bits of particularly important information I have underlined to make sure that I remember them, even though there's a lot of text on this card. That is one of the ways that you will be able to navigate easy, even if you have a lot of text on your location card. As you have seen on the previous cards, bold text can also be used. I usually use that to highlight the monsters in a location. As you can see, location seven is an armory. It's not particularly in interesting. What is interesting here when you refer to the map is that there is a door leading north and that there is a blocked passageway that the player characters might want to clear. If they want to clear that, I will just use the information on location one on clearing the rubble and allow them to clear a passage to area three in the same lot of time. Now we come to area eight. This is the most important or maybe second most important part of this dungeon. It is where the player characters meet the big bad evil guy. The big bad evil guy here is an undead, formerly a wizard called Solar Smistidus. He's a unique undead that I've created. It's a bit inspired by a juju zombie and I've thrown in some magic abilities. The undead wizard Solar Smistidus is supposed to be a difficult opponent. He uses spells every round and combines that with other movement or melee attacks. I have given him a climb speed, allowing him to climb walls and ceilings in this area, therefore trying to make it a more interesting combat, even though it's just happening in a plain room. I must remember that the walls in this room are covered with tapestry and when he first tries to climb these walls to get to the ceiling he might be tearing down some of these tapestries, thereby risking the entanglement described earlier in area 4. On the back side of the Solar Vestitus monster card I have also added an illustration from the dungeon magazine that depicts Solar Vestitus. I think the art is really good and evocative and brings with it some of this old school AD&D feeling, so I'm eager to show this to the players. Aside from the monster card for Solus Vestitus, I have also created a card for the magic missile spell. This is not really necessary since the spell is very simple and a staple of many, many Dungeons & Dragons games, but since I have made some modifications to how magic missile works in my game, I think it's good to have this card handy, especially if one of the player characters acquires Solus Vestitus spellbook and learns the magic missile spell. Then I would be able to give this card to the player and show them how the spell works in my game. The last location in this adventure is the treasury. I've created a card with very, very fine print for the treasury because there's a lot of loot in here, which I want to have in one card. 
I don't think it's a big problem that the print is so small. I can read it well enough. I will not be referring to the card in combat. I will be doing it in a situation where I have the player's attention and they are all eager to hear what they find in the treasury. What is important, however, is that, as I've done in the other location cards, I have highlighted the monster guarding this room, a bugbear ghoul with bold letters so I can easily see it. I have added a map of the area. That is because I have changed the layout of this area. In the original adventure, as you can see, there's a labyrinth. Labyrinths, in my experience, don't work very well when playing role-playing games, unless you have something else going on. Navigating left, right, left, right isn't very interesting. It becomes interesting if the party is being chased by a minotaur, or if the walls move around, or if there are traps, stuff like that. As it is right here in this adventure, it's not very interesting. And therefore, I changed location 9 for this adventure to be a 50-foot deep cavern where the player characters have to navigate a rope bridge across the chasm and over to a higher recess. And from there, they will be navigating a natural stair down to the bottom of the cavern where they will find the door to the treasury. For the treasury, I've also made a monster card of the bugbear ghoul. This ghoul resembles some normal ghouls, except that it's a bugbear ghoul, and therefore I've given it more of a hit dice and made it tougher. When the player characters have defeated the bugbear ghoul, the interesting part starts. They will find the six chests and will be able to go through them. These chests have monetary treasures like coins and jewelry and rich tapestries, but there are also some magic things. In one of the chests, the player characters will find magical potions, but one of the potions might not be what it seems to be. Therefore, I have created this item card to remind myself that just this one potion has something else going on. And the same goes for the chest with jewelry. One of the pieces of jewelry, a pendant, is actually a very important magical item. The appearance of this pendant has been foreshadowed by some of the dreams that might have been revealed by the amnesia effect in the game. The player characters will rem remember dreams of walking around in the snow, enduring chill winds and wet snow, but also hearing the heavy thudding sounds of hooves coming closer and closer. And when the player characters turn around, there's nothing there, except for the third time they had this dream. A collective dream, of course. When the player characters turn around to face the hoof sound, they only see a piece of jewelry lying in the snow. A piece of jewelry that looks like a silver chain with a horse pendant hanging from it. This item is called the Equus. The Equus is a valuable item in its own right, but when the player characters discover the magical nature of the Equus and reach the necessary level, they will be able to call a magnificent destrier from the Elysian Fields. A mount that can be adapted to be a player character paladin's bonded war horse. I have made two cards for the Ecos. One that just describes what the Ecos looks like and says what its monetary value is. And on the back of the card there's an illustration that shows what the horse pendant looks like. The other card, which I will save for later, describes the Ecos magical abilities and also has a stat block for the Ecos itself. The final card I have here is a callback to the earlier video I made about NPC cards. That is because in Bart mentioned in the initial amnesia effect, it's supposed to be a recurring character. He was the quest giver for this adventure, which the players do not know at the start, but they will want to visit this character when they get back to town. And with a bit of luck, he might be able to spur them on on the next adventure. I hope this walkthrough on how I prepared for this adventure gives you an idea on how you can use cards to make your own game easier to run and create a better flow, as well as inspiration for quick and easy preparation. If you haven't seen my previous video on how to use customized cards to run your game, I will add a link in the description of this video so you can see it. I hope you have enjoyed the contents of this video and found it useful, and that you will like and subscribe. Until the next time, keep slaying!